This episode of Revision Path is brought to you by Facebook Design. Diversity at Facebook is a big issue. I asked product designer Jessica Durkin how having a diverse workforce affects what Facebook creates. Having a diverse workforce basically helps us create better products and solutions. That's the bottom line. Everyone is shaped by their own experiences and perspectives. And I think when people bring that into their work, um, they're able to challenge each other, think about problems in different ways, help people consider solutions they hadn't considered before, um, and ultimately create something that serves the diverse population that we're designing for. Learn more at facebook.com forward slash design. Are you looking for a job? Do you know someone who's looking for a job? Then check out our job board over at revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. This week, Jopwell is looking for a product designer in New York City. And Buffer has a remote position available for a customer onboarding and engagement advocate. We also have job listings from indeed.com, so head to the Revision Path job board at revisionpath.com forward slash jobs to apply and to search for any other listings. Don't forget to sign up for weekly job alerts so when there are new positions added to the job board, you'll get an email so you can be the first to apply. Again, that's revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Welcome to the Revision Path Podcast. My name is Maurice Cherry, and before we get into this week's interview, I wanted to let you know that we are coming up on our fifth anniversary, and we're going to have a special anniversary episode on February 26th. Now, last year's anniversary episode, it was a mix of past interviews and things, but this year, I want our anniversary episode to be about you, the listener, because without you, we would not be here, you know? So if you have any questions about the show, if you have questions for me, if you have questions for past guests, uh, send them to revisionpath at gmail.com, and I'll answer them on our anniversary episode. I might even get some of them to come on and, and answer them as well. And we might even have a few special guests, too, so you'll definitely want to tune in. Check the show notes for a link to our blog post with more information. We need you to send those questions in by February 19th. Now let's talk about our sponsors, Glitch, Google Design, MailChimp, and SiteGround. Glitch is the friendly community where you'll build the web app of your dreams. So if your New Year's resolution is learning to code, then look no further. Glitch provides you with a platform to easily start creating anything from a simple website to a Slack bot to a web app using Node.js. Get started on making something awesome today at Glitch.com. Whether it's defining a branding style in VR or creating a voice user interface that actually feels human, Google Design is committed to sharing the best design thinking from Google and beyond. Sign up for great stories, events, and the latest updates on material design at design.google forward slash newsletter. Again, that's design.google forward slash newsletter. You can also follow Google Design on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. It's a new year, which means it's a great time to work on your email marketing efforts. Certainly something that we're trying to do more of here at Revision Path. Let MailChimp's pre-built marketing automation help you out. Automations are like a second brain for your business, and they can do the heavy lifting for your email marketing efforts so you can focus on what's really important, your business. Sign up at MailChimp.com today for a free account. MailChimp. Send better email. SiteGround's hosting services are crafted for professional, business, or enterprise projects. If you need cloud hosting or a dedicated server, SiteGround's got you covered. Are you hosting WordPress or Drupal, Magenta, or Joomla? They can handle that as well. And with award-winning customer support and amazing uptime, you don't have to worry about hosting issues at all. Get started today by visiting SiteGround.com forward slash revision path and get 60% off on all hosting plans. SiteGround, web hosting crafted with care. Now for this week's interview. I'm talking to Raphael Smith, design lead at IDO.org. Let's start the show. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. Hello, my name is Raphael Smith. Um, you can call me Rafa, I go by Rafa. I am a product designer at IDO.org. 
I focus mostly on digital and physical products. So early in my career, I focused mostly on industrial design. Later on, started getting more on the software side with user interface, user experience, interaction design. And now I focus about 50-50 physical products, digital products, and sprinkle in some service design in there as well. So I work with IDEO.org, which operates like the, the nonprofit arm of IDEO. And we focus on addressing issues related to poverty. I do a bit of domestic work. I covered the last few years, I've covered mostly East Africa and South Asia. I've been to the regions I've been working in. And again, doing hardware, software, service design in areas or domains like agriculture, healthcare, and healthcare products. We do a lot of work in youth reproductive health, in financial inclusion and financial access, and figuring out how to leverage design technology to address issues related to poverty within those areas. Wow, that sounds like a lot to cover. <laughs> it is, it is. And I guess the last thing I mentioned, the thing that I've been focusing on that's been really, really exciting for me in the last year or so has been trying to explore how we can leverage, how we can use design technology to address issues of bias. And so kind of that intersection of, we know diversity and inclusion is a huge issue. We know bias is rampant in every single facet of, of our lives. and how and where can technology step up and start to play a role? That's been a more of a passion project of mine, but that's been a big focus for me over the last year or so. Well, I do want to you know talk about that, so I'll make sure to, to ask you about that later. But walk me through sort of a, a typical day for you at IDEO. What are you working on? So typical day at IDEO, uh, it, it really varies depending on the phase of the project we're in. So if we are in an ideation phase, it's it's working within your team. Usually we work in teams of three to four, maybe five people on a specific project. I tend to work on one project at a time. So we have our own project space and we work collaboratively to come up with new ideas and quickly turn those ideas. We're heavily, heavily focused on prototyping is a big part of the culture here. And so we'll work together to come up with a set of ideas depending on the phase of the project and then start looking towards how do we take these ideas, unpack what are some of the biggest assumptions behind them? How can we turn these ideas into something tangible that we can go test out in the world? So that's like a typical day. Again, it really depends on the phase of the project, but usually it's in, whether it's a day or that week, looking at how do we take a set of ideas that we're working on and turn them into something tangible that can be tested out in the real world. If we're in a research phase of the project, we usually don't take on projects just from our offices wherever we are, we're out in the world trying to learn as much from the user. And so if it's a project around agriculture, we'll be out in the fields with farmers understanding how they make certain decisions around whatever the thing we're studying is in context, or we'll be in someone's living room interviewing them about how they interact with this service or product and how it could be improved. And so during research moments, we're out in the world learning as much as possible we retreat back to the offices for specific moments to brainstorm ideas or to, to flush out and build those ideas into something that can be tested, but then really quickly run back out in the world and testing those things. Now, what made you decide to get involved with service design? I know you, you went to Purdue University and you started out in industrial design. What kind of made you want to take this switch uh, into what you're doing now? So I'd say that the beginning few years of my career were just in in industrial design. I worked for a bunch of consumer product, worked for a bunch of agencies that design mostly consumer products. So vacuum cleaners, coffee makers, toasters, those kinds of houseware products. And worked for that for a few years. I fell in love with the craft. I loved the craft. I was blown away. I was, I felt like I was working with the smartest people on the planet. And also at the same time, I fell in love with the craft, but felt really disappointed with the content of the work. And, and I think after you design your second or your third coffee maker, I think you start to ask yourself a lot of questions about the world. <laughs> and I was like, what? And it was like all this genius people and ideas floating around. And I felt all that was just being channeled into optimizing products that are great, but they I didn't feel like that. Gen I felt like that genius could be channeled in so many other directions beyond a coffee maker or a toaster. And so that kind of pushed me <laughs> to one, having like an existential crisis about what am I doing with my life, but also pushed me to start exploring, like, how can I use this craft I love to start to address issues that I think are more are bigger, higher order issues in the world. And so that kind of drove me into the kind of exploring like how design can show up in the social sector. We can get into this later, but that drove me down a couple years of 
designing or working on a startup that designed emergency shelters for disaster relief. After that, I got into kind of that, that company that kind of collapsed. And I ended up moving to San Francisco at the time, right like kind of in the heart of Silicon Valley, startups booming software, UI, UX, interaction design was really picking up. It was an interesting moment where I had done like web work in the past. Like I, I was an industrial designer, but in college I had done like websites or graphics for websites here and there just to make a little money on the side. And it was an interesting time when I moved to San Francisco. It was around 2010. And it was this time when like all the top tier firms, like all the big either agencies or even all the big tech companies like Google, Facebook, Airbnb, they were sucking up all the top talent for interaction design or like UI UX work. So there's this weird kind of deficit of web mobile designers. And if you had any web experience, any of the B tier companies were willing to give you a shot. And so again, I was definitely not top tier talent that in, in that space of especially web. And but I had enough that a few startups were willing to give me a shot. And so I, I transitioned from just purely industrial design to starting to flex more of that user interface, user experience. And over the last couple of years, took a deep dive into software. And I became the only designer on a relatively large engineering team, learned a lot about the software side. And over a couple of years, really built up that skill set of UI, UX and interaction design. And at some point, kind of had those two skill sets that, that were attractive to a company like IDEO.org, which was looking for these multidisciplinary designers. And I kind of had the background in both hardware and software. And that brought me to IDEO, where I've kind of been flexing those skills. But so much of the work we do isn't just siloed into just hardware, just software, but we're working on a physical product that has a digital element. It also has a service and a business model wrapped around it. And so the way I've kind of grown is kind of like this jack of all trades designer, but it, it kind of evolved organically over my career in stepping up and just trying to fill the needs of whichever projects I was working on at the time. I know that there's usually conversation about whether a designer should be more well-rounded and know a lot of skills or if they should be a specialist. And I feel like with the past few years, at least companies have have tended to to trend towards just wanting to bring on specialists, like someone who was mm -hmm. just a product designer or they just did interaction or they just did experience design or something like that. It sounds like, though, with your your breadth of skills that allows you to kind of work, I don't want to say across the stack because that, that kind of plays more into development as well, but it sounds like you've been able to cover a lot of bases with uh, with the knowledge that you have. Yeah, yeah. And I, I definitely see that trend happening right now, too. And I think that's, I would guess that I think that's like a more of a pendulum swing. I think that we're going to probably forever be like on this pendulum of swinging from interdisciplinary approaches more to like specialization and back and forth. And I think the reality, I think there's there's a deep need for both. Right. And I think like specialization allows you to execute at a really high fidelity and provide design excellence. But I think that what being a generalist, or at least having generalists around on a team, what that enables is that it helps us avoid certain traps, right? And I think that like, oftentimes when we're designing, like that old expression, when the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the biggest lessons I've learned in my career is to be medium agnostic, right? What is the problem that we're solving? Hold that and let that be the North Star. And then go about that in a medium agnostic way. So if we know what the problem is, we can maybe it's a physical product. That's the solution. Or maybe it's a digital product or maybe it's a service or maybe it's a combination of all those things that is actually the right path towards solving that issue or raising the, the big opportunity we're after. And I think that that only happens when we have multidisciplinary designers that are able to let go of I'm a product designer or I'm a graphic designer or I'm an architect. and rather let, have a more emergent process that enables the right solution and the right set of crafts and skills and technologies to be elevated in order to solve the problem rather than imposing our skill sets because it's the only ones we have onto whatever we're trying to do. Well, how do you see the design communities start to tackle problems as we look at, I feel like there's been this big thing lately around defensive design. I don't know if you've heard about this, about where cities are sometimes mm -hmm. creating design impediments against the people that live in the city? Do you know what I'm talking about? No, I don't. Like, for well, example, I saw this a lot when I was in London recently. I, th I saw it a little bit in New York, too. But like, for example, someone will design a bench, but the bench is not designed for sitting. 
at least not for extended periods of time because of the way that they've, I guess, yeah. created the curves and the shapes of it. It's only designed for you to maybe lean against it for a while and then go about your way. Or you'll see storefronts that have spikes in their windowsills. So someone mm-hmm. can't sit mm-hmm. there or stand there. That sort of like defensive design. Interesting. Defensive design. Huh. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I totally know what you're talking about. Now. I saw it in, I saw it in New York too. Specifically around that? Well, no, I saw it in New York too. Like in the subway, they have these, uh, it's not a bench. It's like a stack. <laughs> it's like a lean to. It's like they yeah. have like a, like a slab of wood against the wall and you can just kind of lean against mm. it, but you can't sit on it. I'm like, what good is that? Yeah. <laughs> like I mean, yeah. like I may need to sit down. I don't want to just lean against something. And I, I know that I think some of these yeah. things are done to try to curb, you know, perhaps homeless populations or something like that. But it just feels like, I don't know. I, I've been seeing it a lot recently. I saw it even when I was in Chicago recently. I mean, I'm seeing more and more examples of it pop up. It's sort of something that just like, I can't escape it. It feels like, have you seen a lot of that? Yeah. before? I do. I do know what you're talking about. And I think that, Hmm. Without having a specific example, I think that like there's probably two. And I think like at best, they could be benign solutions that are maybe solving issues that aren't always visible. Like maybe the lean to instead of the sitting bench is just making it safer because we need more people to stand and take less space on the subway platform. So I think like at best, we're seeing like maybe design defensive design pop up to solve issues to actually solve problems that normal behavior might cause. I think at worst, they're probably like the latter thing of what you mentioned. Like oftentimes these kind of defensive designs get weaponized against people, as you mentioned, the homeless populations. Or I think oftentimes these designs become, instead of actually solving the issue of like, why do we have a homeless population? Or why do we have people that are having to sleep in the park or on the subway? We're kind of putting, trying to put a Band-Aid on a gunshot wound, right? We're trying to like not solve the problem, but just deter people from doing it not in my backyard kind of style. And so, again, I think at their most benign, they can be great solutions to solve issues that we might not be aware of. And otherwise, I think they get weaponized against people that do not have the same economic resources. Right. I'm interested to kind of know a little bit more about your early career. You you mentioned industrial design. You've been mentioning a little bit of uh, of web design. Was that back when you were at Purdue? Yep. Yep. And mostly industrial design. Yeah. What was your time like there? I had an incredible time. I, had, you know, I got really, I felt really, really fortunate. I wasn't a great student in high school. I didn't, I wasn't like one of those students that like, I had so many friends that were like, they knew what they wanted to do. They, they had researched all the top schools. Like they like had this plan and like, I, <laughs> I wish I was that had been that student, but I, a series of really fortunate events kind of even got me in that position. And like, I, that was the, Purdue was the only school I applied to. It was the state school. It was an hour north of where I grew up. Like, and I got really, I didn't know what industrial design was until maybe a few months before I had like, (laughs) they just happened to have a program. I I had this art teacher. I mean, again, I was not a stellar student in most of the academic courses. And I had an art teacher who I used to take all the art classes that I could. And this art teacher she she gave us a this assignment one day. We had to design. She gave us all eggs, like hard boiled eggs, and we had to design packaging and a brand for an egg. And like I was so into this project, I like stayed after school. I came up. I think the idea was <laughs> I came up with like the Gatorade of eggs. It was called like Power Egg or something like that. <laughs> and I did the packaging, the brand, I did this whole thing. And she pulls me aside one day and she was like, Rafa, like I think I think you have some raw talent. Have you ever thought about design as a career? And I hadn't at that point. I hadn't. I didn't know what I was going to do after school. I was a senior, like no real plan. And she used to be a graphic designer. Now she was an art educator. And, and she sat me down and showed me her portfolios and sh- she taught me what graphic design was. She showed me what industrial design was. And so that kind of was in the back of my head. And I still, I applied again. I applied at one school, the state school that was an hour, hour away from me. And I went in as an undecided major. And the week before classes started, my college counselor just told me, like, pick something. She was like, students in her experience do better when they choose something instead of starting with, with like undecided major. And so she was like, what do you like? And I was like this, I don't know, like 18 year old. I was like, oh no, I like cars. I like drawing. And she was like, have you heard of industrial design? And I was like, oh yeah, that's what my, um, so my high school art teacher was talking about. Sign me up. And 
I, Maurice, I don't know how, like, <laughs> the grace that happened after that of so many doors opening for me, but I landed in industrial design and design school there at Purdue, and it was the first time ever academically, like, I excelled at something, and it was something I loved, and and a lot of it, I have to get credit to my father. Like, my father was a machinist, so my dad worked for General Motors, later on an aerospace company, but my dad was a machinist. He made airplane engine parts. And outside of work, like he and his friends would work on hot rods on old cars. So like my dad built, like he just last summer finished a 1938 Chevy, but like all through my childhood, he would work on these old like 30s, 40s, 50s model cars, like actual cars. And he and his friends were like this group, this older generation of skilled labor men that worked, they were part of UAW, they worked General Motors, Chrysler, Ford, they were the machinists and outside of work, they would build and design these incredible pieces of, I'd call them moving art. These cars were incredible. Mm -hmm. And since I was in a garage since the day I could remember walking, right, I was in there handing my dad tools and learning how to build. And that was a generation of folks that didn't have the same opportunities I had, right? Like my dad didn't go to college. He didn't have someone tell him that design was an option. And so, but those skill sets, I got to design school and I was like, I've been doing this my whole life. This is easy. What do you mean? Like solve a problem like that? I know how to do. I know how to build something. I know. And so design school was intuitive to me. I found it. It was incredible. Yeah. I'll, I'll pause there. <laughs> Interesting. So it sounds like you've always sort of had this exposure to it, but it just never kind of, I guess, metastasized in a way until you got to, to college. Yeah, I'd say that's accurate. Yeah. Did you have anything else in mind that you wanted to do? Like if if you hadn't went into design, what do you think you would have been doing? Uh, <laughs> like when I was in high school, I started working. I started working. When I was like fourteen or fifteen. I, think I was fifteen when I got my first like job, job, and I worked like full time during the summer. Then I worked like weekends. And I grew up in Indiana, in Indianapolis, and Indiana gets rural pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And so I got a job on a horse farm. And <laughs> wow! And like I, at that point been exposed to like horses or rural America. And I started working on this horse farm and I had this dream. I was like, I'm going to be a horse trainer. Wow. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> so that was like, at some point during high school, I thought I was, <laughs> was going to be a horse trainer. And I mean, I learned a lot through that job. I, it was incredible. But uh, yes, yeah, so that was, I didn't have that much vision at that point in my life. Well, it sounds like, you know, design is really kind of what has helped you out a lot. Like you said, it really opened a lot of doors for you once you really got into it. Yeah, it's been an amazing journey so far. I feel really blessed. Like it's been an amazing journey. Do you have a specific philosophy as a designer that, that maybe you've you've built up or, or you've learned over the past few years? I do, I think. You mean unpack philosophy for me? Like when you approach a new project or something, is there a certain way that you go about it with your process? How do you approach the issue? How do you gather research? Things like that. I've been really, I think, and my philosophy has been really influenced and shaped by the IDEO approach to work and like design thinking and human centered design. But to get more specifically into the philosophy, I think that like approaching a problem, I think when I, I look at like the like design thinking is such a big part of the like design conversation right now about like engaging users and design research being a fundamental part of process. And I think when I look at that trend, the underlying philosophy behind that is almost like and like a Socratic kind of like, I know that I know nothing approach. And, I, and like, it's, it's been a big shift from designers going from being treated as experts and these knowledge holders to a better and gentler philosophy, in my opinion, of saying, we don't actually know anything. And, and I think we went from, again, I think what this kind of shift in the design industry towards design thinking and human centered design has done is kind of debunk the myth of the lone genius designer. You know, that, that idea that there's like this designer that can just sit in a room and like magically come up with this amazing solution. And I think what this shift in philosophy and the sector in general has done is kind of debunk that myth and saying like, no, actually we don't know, we know nothing. And, but all the answers to what we're looking for exist out in the real world. And all we have to do is go ask the right questions. And, and a couple of metaphors or kind of analogies that come to mind. Like I, I think there's like one of my mentors, I remember saying something around like there's a multiple, like 
one author says design in the medium, right? Like you think of what the medium is for like an oil painter, right? For an oil painter, their medium is the canvas and the paint. Like that's the, that's a painter's and an oil painter's medium is the canvas and the paint. And they might temporarily or momentarily step outside their medium to maybe do like, like, I don't know, like a charcoal sketch to get the composition of the paint painting on another sheet of paper before they jump straight back to their medium. But really quickly, they're moving back into their medium. And when we think of like us as designers, like what is our medium? For a lot of us, our medium is the real world, right? Our medium isn't the boardroom or post-it notes or like the project space. Our medium is the real world, whether it's our products or our applications or our their designs are existing in the real world and we need to be designing in the medium, right? And so often we're trained in college and in other places to hold on to that expert mode mentality, that myth of the lone genius that can just sit in this isolated room and come up with a fantastic solution when we should be spending more time out in the world. We should be quickly turning our ideas into prototypes that we can put in front of users and have them interact with our ideas in a tangible format. And so I guess my philosophy of design is finding ways to accelerate the pace of learning because we don't know anything when we're starting usually. We're not the users in most cases and pushing ourselves to design in the medium, which is the real world, rather than designing from a place of theory in our cushy offices. What would you say your medium is? It's kind of the same thing? Absolutely. I mean, with everything I do, my medium is the real world. Yeah. Yeah. What is some advice that has really kind of stuck with you over the years in your career? A couple of things come to mind. Like, I remember going to talk when I was living in San Francisco. This designer, I, was, I looked up to a lot at the time, a name Azza Raskins. He was like one of the first interface designers for Firefox. I remember him saying something like, the problem is not just solving the problem. The problem is defining the problem. And... I think like design research is such a foundational piece of my process of going out into the world, asking questions before I start to draw or build. It's really trying to engage and immerse myself in the end user's experience. And, and again, the idea like the problem is not just solving the problem, but the problem is defining the problem is probably like the thing that I've never forgotten. It's like such a foundational piece. And I think that when I look at the designers that I look up to most, they have, they become masters of learning how to learn, right? Like, like they have, whether it's through design research or methods or really quickly turning something into a prototype, they're able to go and like most of the work we do, especially at IU.org, I, I'm never a domain expert. Like I know nothing about agriculture or, or healthcare or finance. Like I'm, those aren't, I'm not a domain expert in any of those things. So usually I'm on a project for like three months or four months at a time. So I get thrown into a new field or domain that I'm not an expert in. I'm usually not a cultural expert. And so what we have to rely on is our ability to accelerate the pace of learning and learning how to learn within a new field, within a new culture. And so I think the best advice I've gotten has been around how exactly about what I said about like learning how to learn and focusing on the problem is not just solving the problem, but the problem is defining the problem. I want to talk about some of your your current work that you're doing right now around design and bias. I know you did a talk. I think it was the talk that you did at the Design and Diversity Conference. That was in August, I think. Yeah, August. Yep, yep, um, yep. Talk to me a little bit about yep. why you decided to go and uh, and speak on that subject. Not just at, necessarily at that conference, but in general. Mm. Why why have you been kind of approaching design and bias as a topic? Yeah, it's like my favorite subject to talk about. <laughs> I love this. So... Just being like a person of color in tech, right? Like I'm half black, half Latino, and I work in tech and mostly. And and I think the stats are the tech world, it's like 2% black, 3% Latinx. And, and the reason it's because it, it directly impacts me, right? Like my experience has been impacted by by that. And the, the, such little representation for most of my career, looking around and not seeing people that look like me, not seeing people that have experiences that I do and seeing how this design sector, how the tech sector is exclusionary in a lot of ways. And so that's like one set of things. The other one is I think it's fascinating to kind of explore the intersections of where can design and technology start to address like 
bias is more, I think of bias, I think of like a psychologist or a sociologist and starting to think of how design and tech can play a role in these fields that have been traditionally pushed forward or led by other crafts is really exciting to me. And so kind of out of that space, actually the, the hard way it happened, like I went to a conference like a year, almost two years ago, my boss actually was invited to go to this conference and last minute she had to cancel. So she asked me to go in her place and the conference just asked me to bring a provocation to the theme of the conference. I think that the theme of the conference was like, like, how do we get more designers in the social sector? And they asked me to bring a provocation. So like each panelist got like seven minutes to talk with their provocation. There was like a panel discussion. And so like my provocation was like, I just think that was a fundamentally wrong question to talk about at the conference. Like it's not, how do we get more designers in the social sector? It's like, how do we get a wider set of people equipped to be doing design? And the thing I talked about was like, I hear the word empathy like 5,000 times a day. And, and I think as an industry, we've confused the word sympathy and empathy. And that as an hmm. industry, we have to stop pretending that just going and sitting in someone's living room for an hour and asking them about their life during a design research phase, like that sitting in someone's living room for two hours doesn't build empathy, right? Like we have to have a wider group of people, like not one person can have empathy for everyone else. And we have, a, have to have a wider group of people equipped with these tools and these practices. And so that, I gave that talk and I was kind of nervous. I had never really talked that publicly about race before, like talk about it all the time, like my own personal life, but like on stage at a conference, like, and nervous, but it was pretty well received. And through that, I got invited to talk or to actually teach a class at School of Visual Arts last year. And so one of the, Alan, who runs the um, products of design program at graduate program at School of Visual Arts, asked me to teach a class on design and bias. And so I'd never taught a class before. So I went back and forth with him kind of building out a syllabus, I had an incredible co-teacher, Jennifer Rittner. And we, we ended up designing this class called Designing for Unconscious Bias. And that kind of became this exploration zone of like, what does this even mean? Like, what is possible? How can design and technology address issues of bias? And, and for that class, I kind of started because the students were like, what is this? Like, what, I don't even know what this means. Like, where do I start? And so in order to create some kind of scaffolding or kind of sandbox for students to know where they could play, I started just kind of pulling case studies out of thin air. Like I would have calls with like heads of diversity and inclusion programs and with colleagues and just trying to pull case studies to see like where has design and technology actually shown up in addressing issues of bias? Because I mean, there's no like Tumblr blog you can go to that's like the top 10 examples of designing for unconscious bias. Like it doesn't <laughs> exist. So I had to like, kind of pull these these case studies out of thin air. And I was just doing that to provide kind of this, again, scaffolding for the students. And that unexpectedly became kind of a landscape analysis for who is doing the work. Like where is design and tech really showing up in a solid way? And where are the just massive empty vacuums in space where like there's massive opportunity, but no one's addressing anything. And so that was a 15 week class. And after that class, I was just asking, I was like, why is no one doing this? And why is no one doing that thing? And so since then, I've been building a few prototypes around those kind of big vacuum areas that I saw when I was trying to kind of paint the landscape of the people and products that are starting to address that area. Where do you see your work kind of continuing in that area? So right now, we've got a prototype out. I mean, I think one thing I'm excited about is I think this sector needs to be more data driven. And so I think there's some some really, really exciting stuff happening out of the Bay. You look at Blendor, Stephanie Lampkin at Blendor, Atypica, Talent, Sonar. There's a lot of really cool tools emerging that are helping companies be more data driven when it comes to addressing bias in the kind of attracting and recruiting talent in that portion of the employee life cycle. Something, a prototype we just launched here, um, I built a really rough version of an analytics tool that helps companies be more data driven about understanding how bias shows up for existing employees. And so we built this analytics tool that helps companies track pay gaps. I mean, we know consistently that women are paid 20% less than men across the board in most places. I mean, and that's also true of like people of color. I don't know the actual stat for, for people of color, but I know it's significantly less. So how an analytics tool that helps companies track pay gaps, promotion differences. So we could look within this department and say, within this department, it takes, I don't know, let's say women of color, 15% longer than men to rise to senior management. And if that's the case, if that's the insight that the software can kind of pull out, 
the software can also then be smart and start to recommend, if that's the case, that's likely an indicator that, that there's a bias in how that department is doing employee performance reviews. And in that case, start making recommendations for how to address that type of bias that, that the trends are showing. So that's one tool we've been working on is like, how do you address bias within existing workforces? Another one that's been on my mind a lot has been, um, I saw, I think not that long ago, I saw Van Jones talk and he said something, I'm going to mess it up a little bit. He said something like, it's not just about making rich groups more diverse, but making diverse groups richer. Right. And, and when we talk about bias and diversity and inclusion, I think we often hear like narratives around how do we make relatively privileged spaces like more colorful or with more women. But I think that like we also have to be addressing like like what Van Jones says, how do we make diverse groups richer? They look at the wealth gaps in this country. And, and so basically another thing that's been on my mind recently is like an idea that we're starting to play around with is how like supplier diversity is is a big thing, or at least should be a big thing. And like I think the stats are like 49 percent of Americans that are employed by small businesses and so small businesses are the backbone of our economy. But I would be willing to bet that the same resources that flow to white and male owned businesses are not flowing to either POC or women owned businesses. And so another way that we've been playing around with is like, how can analytics show up and help companies be more data driven and make it easier for them to increase their supplier diversity? And so I know like the company I work at, we probably spend globally, we probably spend millions of dollars a year on catering, on cleaning services, on maintenance services. And unless companies are actually intentional in tracking who is landing with those contracts, who are we giving these contracts to? The default is, I'm willing to bet, white and male. And so I think it's another big place where analytics can show up is is helping companies increase their supplier diversity, which I think then starts to address some of the economic issues that Van Jones is talking about. I would love to see some more implementations of that kind of data-driven, you know, sort of work as it comes to combating bias. Because I think what we've seen initially has been a lot of anecdotal evidence. And don't get me wrong, that's important mm-hmm. too. We've seen like anecdotal sociological studies and things like that. But for a lot of businesses, I feel like it still doesn't, it's still not resonating. Like even now, I think as we've seen over the past five years in design and in tech and other industries as well, the needle hasn't really yeah. moved a lot as it has come to, mm-hmm. you know, kind of changing the diversity problem. And mostly that breaks down around race and gender and companies try to be more creative with how they look at diversity. Maybe they're looking at different schools or maybe more non-traditional type employees or things like that. But I think having that data would sort of separate any kind of, hopefully would separate any kind of lingering personal bias that people have because it's not about you as the person. It's about the data. The data is telling us these determinations. It's not something that we're coming to based off of consulting or anything like that. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think like, I don't know, somebody smart said that line, which is like, what doesn't get measured doesn't get managed. Yeah. Or what gets measured gets managed, right? And like, I think that when we look at the broadly, the space of diversity and inclusion has become such a hot button issue recently. But like you said, it's really anecdotal. And I think most, and through a lot of the interviews we've done is like a lot of HR people or even people in leadership feel like they're left with really theoretical approaches to addressing diversity and inclusion, right? So it's doing this diversity or unconscious bias training over here or start this employee resource group over there. But I think until we get, until we're able to pinpoint how bias shows up, whether it's in our recruitment or whether it's in the way we do promotions or, or, the, or the way that we compensate our employees, until we have the hard data that starts to point to where bias shows up. And then I think that nuance is necessary in order to, to really start to move, no, to even know where to act and to start to move the needle. Yeah, one more thing I'll say is that I don't think technology and design is the silver bullet for addressing bias, but I think it's an incredibly powerful tool, right? And so I think there's a much larger emotional and interpersonal changes that need to happen in order to really remove bias from our workplaces. But I think as that societal shift happens, I think design and technology can be a really useful tool in helping us get there. So again, I don't think it's a silver bullet, but I think it is a tool, a necessary tool. Mm -hmm. Where do you want to see design go into the future? Do you have an answer off the top of your head? Well, I think. (laughs) Like, where do I want to see design going into the future? Yeah. 
you know, I think more about it, it approaching the realm of speculative design where you're using design yeah, to kind of yeah. create ideas and not necessarily just, you know, just things. It's something that I think we're already starting to see, particularly if we look at kind of design thinking, you know, like I feel like that mm-hmm. phrase tends to get played out a lot, but that is an application and a way that design can be used in other types of, you know, non-design fields to create ideas and create systems and things that can really help people out. Like, for example, we've had a lot of UX, well, not a lot, we've had two, we've had two UX consultants on the show and they talk about how they kind of go into businesses Mm -hmm. and they help with, it's not about designing websites, they're designing cultures, they're designing ways that, that companies do outreach for, you know, jobs and things like that, so... I kind of see design being used ostensibly, hopefully in that way. I don't want to say that we've kind of tapped yeah. out on on physical design. Certainly, I think there's more places to go as we just look at more use cases. I, honestly, I think even as the, the world is changing with climate and population, we'll start to see design being used in, you know, kind of different, interesting ways. But certainly the future of design is less about things and more about ideas. Mm. I'd agree with that. Yeah, I think like, like kind of, yeah, I like that like design is everything, right? Design is systems, design is organizations, design. I like that idea. Like, I think the future is like design is woven into anything. Yeah. Right. And like even, I mean, even elites like Stanford are starting like with the D school, like the, I think the president of Stanford said that like his goal in the next few years is to make sure that every single student, regardless of his major, leaves the university with some fluency in design thinking, right? Like mm. that. I think that design isn't this isolated craft that like people with like fancy glasses and like black turtlenecks do. It's like something that everyone does. Like design is everything. Design is how we design our lives. Design is how we design our organizations. Design is how we, because everything is design, right? We're constantly designing everything and every, and I think like even David Kelly, one of the founders of IDEO wrote the book recently, like creative confidence, right? And we've somehow unnecessarily given this title of like you hear people say oh i'm not a creative type i'm not a this like humans are creative like it's in our dna like we invented every we invented the wheel we invented fire like we we didn't invent fire but we figured out how to harness fire like design has been such a core part of our evolution as a species and like somehow in the recent past we've gone from like everyone being a designer and a problem solver to only a set few people being able to have that title. Mm -hmm. And I think like the future of design is when design is in everything. Design is an approach. Design is a process to business to, again, how we organize ourselves in our lives. Talk to me about design futurism. I guess it's sort of related to what we're we're talking about now in a way, but but I want to hear from you when when you think about design futurism, what is that to you? This is so fascinating. So this is something I've recently started to get in. Like this is like my new kind of I've been dabbling and and been exploring. And and you started to touch on a few things around speculative design and design futurism. And I think like the necess- the reason is so important. Even when we were talking about like diversity and inclusion earlier. I think that like as designers, as people, like we have to start envisioning and imagining our futures because if we don't, we're gonna be living in someone else's imagined future. Mm-hmm. Right. And if history has taught us anything, it's that most of these new shifts in technology or policy somehow get weaponized against black and brown people or or poor folks. And so I think that design futurism for me is an exercise in how do we start to create these new worlds and and that, that we can eventually start working towards. And, and you and I, we linked for the first time in person at the Black and Design Conference at Harvard just a couple months ago, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I remember DeRay McKesson, who keynoted on Saturday, I remember him saying a line, this whole like speculative design is something that came up for me a lot over and over again throughout that conference. And I remember DeRay said this line, it was something like, freedom isn't just the absence of oppression, but it's the presence of joy and justice, Yeah. right? And so, yeah, freedom isn't the absence of oppression, but it's the presence of joy and justice. And the reason that felt so profound to me, because I was thinking about my training as a designer, I have been almost my entire career has been spent reacting to problems. I'm given a client brief, I'm getting given a set of constraints, and I am reacting to a problem, which is kind of the first part of that sentence, which is like trying to create an absence of oppression, right? And like, there's a difference to me in like just reacting to a problem 
than building a new world that we want to live in. Those are two fundamentally different like thought patterns. Mm -hmm. And I was reflecting, I was also talking to one, one of my good friends here in New York, a guy named Rasu. He was asked to teach a class at NYU last year. And the theme was around, I think initially it was redesigning the criminal justice system. And that's kind of what the, I know, the faculty kind of laid out. And when he came to teach the class, like on the first day, he, he was like, class, throw out your syllabus the only thing I want you to think about, we're not redesigning the criminal justice system. The only thing we're going to think about this semester is what does a post-carceral America look like? Hmm. And that, that to me seems also so profound because those are two fundamentally different questions. Redesigning the criminal justice system versus imagining a post-carceral America are two completely different questions that beginning with those as design prompts what end you up in or what will end up in two radically different solutions. Right. Yeah. And so, so often I think we get stuck in the constraints of the here and the now. And like, we have to live in reality. We can't just be designing in a vacuum completely, but I think the idea of design fictions or speculative design or this futurism allows us to release some of these constraints that are optimizing an already broken system and start to put us in a world of imagining what do we actually want to be working towards and how do we actually start to define that North Star of where we're trying to go. When you look back at, you know, the time that you first started down this path of design, what do you wish you would have known? Oof. I would have prepared myself for the emotional journey that I think is inherent to any creative possible or any creative outlet or endeavor. One of the values at that IDEO is, is embrace ambiguity. And that is, I would have, <laughs> I think I would have given myself the advice of embrace ambiguity because design is uncomfortable. And there's not a single project I work on that I don't for at least at some part feel like, right, so I usually go through this, this like roller coaster of an emotional journey in every single project I work on. And at some point it's like, we go out in the field, we we have some amazing interviews that lead to these like breakthrough insights and we start to ideate and we come up with these really, really exciting concepts. And at some point I'm like, oh my God, I'm the greatest designer that ever walked the face of this earth. And then like no joke within a couple of days of that feeling of like this team and I'm so great, I will have the exact polar opposite emotion of when stuff gets hard and we're sitting in that ambiguity of really trying to figure out a product market fit or figure out how we take these insights that we learned and translate them into design. Like every single project, there's a couple of days where I'm like, I am the worst designer that has ever walked the face of this planet. And I'm not even saying that like, like exaggerating, like I go between those extremes of like, we are so amazing. We are like building the future. Mm -hmm. I am the worst designer to ever walk the face of this earth. And that is every single project. I have never been able to escape that. And I'm getting better and better, right? The more I go through, every single time I go through, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. We always come out of that valley of disillusionment and come up with a solution. And now I wish I would have told my younger self to be able to just embrace the ambiguity, lean into the discomfort because you're just the process. You will get through it. And I think of that, that would be like probably the number one advice that I give myself. Can I keep going? Cause a couple of other things that come yeah, to sure. mind. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Like, like my first week at, at IDEO.org, we had so the, the CEO of IDEO, Tim Brown, and then the creative director, uh, one of the, the global creative directors came and talked to us and, and their advice, and I was kind of with this cohort that all started on the same day. And I remember their advice being one, allow yourself to be a novice. Right. I think like we go to school or we learn a skill set and we become an expert and we think we have to show up as an expert all the time. And their advice was one, allow yourself to be a novice. And Paul Bennett, the creative director, global creative director of IDEO, said something following on to that. He said, my career took off the day I stopped trying to be the cleverest person in the room. Hmm. And and those two things always hmm. stuck with me, like allow yourself to be a novice and don't try to be the cleverest person in the room. And those two mixed with the idea of like, if I could have written a letter to my former like 22 year old self starting in the design industry, like I would have told myself to prepare for the emotional journey. And like, and also I think like the advice is like, I would have told myself that my dreams are my responsibility, right? Like I have to carve out intentional time every day or at least once a week 
to say, what do I want to do? Like, how do I want to leverage this craft in the world? And I would have told myself, you cannot rely on the HR department or the, the your mentor at work or whoever it is to define what your career journey is going to be. Like you, your dreams are your responsibility and you have to carve out intentional time to let yourself dream and let yourself imagine what your career can be or what your life can be. Do you have a dream project that you love to do? I have an area of focus. So I don't, uh, this is kind of emerging and I'm recently, I kind of been in this mode of like really listening to that advice of letting myself dream. Like almost every night when I go home, I start to write down like, what are these things? Like, what do I want? How do I want to develop as a person, as a designer? On um, the weekends, I carve out time on Saturday mornings, just a free sketch. I go to a coffee shop down the block and just let myself draw a product or whatever it is, is emerging from me at that moment, really protecting that creative time and just letting myself be creative for the sake of creativity without the burden of a client or a budget or a deadline. And my dream project is, I think, the intersection of design and emotions. And like, I think of, I know it's really meta, but like, I look at, I think so, I think so many challenges in our world today, we look at like, I mean, the political landscape, the, I think a lot of our politicians, uh, people in the world are dealing with unresolved trauma and like there's a lack of emotional intelligence, not even emotional intelligence, but I think that there is an opportunity for design to play a role in helping us be the best versions of ourselves. And I think a lot of that like personal, I think a lot of, I think there's an emotional revolution that is possible that allows us to, to understand what it means to be in right relationship with ourselves in right relationship with the people around us. And I'll give it like a tiny example. Like I, I was having a conversation with a friend recently, like who I've never been a great meditator. Like I've always wanted to be someone who meditates and is mindful. I, I've never been, been able yet to build that habit. And I was talking to a friend who was really in like the mindfulness space. And she was saying how like every morning she sets intentions of like today I will listen or today I will be compassionate when my boss drives me to my last nerve or whatever it is. And, and I was thinking, I was like, wow, like when I actually take the time and like set intention, like I, I feel my day goes different. I actually act on it. But usually I either forget to do that or by the time I set intention, by 10 a.m., I already forgot what it was. And so like, I think that there's a, an opportunity when we look at the whole space of emotional intelligence or, or how we process emotions, I think there's an opportunity for design to help build tools that enable us to build those right habits and mindfulness that ultimately affect how we show up every day in the world with ourselves, with our loved ones, with everyone around us. And so I'm really interested in exploring the space of how design and technology can help us on this emotional revolution. What do you want to accomplish this year for 2018? What do you want to accomplish? It's more of a feeling. In 2018, I want to design from, from a place of joy. And I know that also sounds really meta, but I'll give an example. Like when I was in, in school, I studied, I studied German. And, and I remember being taught a few of like the Enlightenment era German, like literary masters, right? Like I remember one of my professors talking to us about comparing the German poet and author Goethe to the, the novelist Schiller. Like the, he was comparing like these two kind of juggernauts of the German literature Enlightenment era and comparing the two the two processes against each other. And he was describing Goethe was like this like author, this novelist and poet who would like, he was probably romanticizing it a bit, but like who would travel the world and like write a book of poetry from like a summer, uh, I don't know, a French prince would invite him to like spend a summer writing this book of poetry from their like summer residence. And he'd go travel the world and write a novel from this other place in the world. And and he was inspired by the people and the places that he came in contact with. And that showed up in his work. And his work was from a place of joy. And that he was comparing this Goethe to this other author, Schiller, who also created these literary masterpieces. But every single book he wrote killed him a little bit more right and he, like he lived in this like, cabin on the edge of the black forest like by himself in this life of solitude and it was grind and and as a designer like over my career i find myself oscillating between those two spaces of working from a place of joy or working from a place of grind 
And, and oftentimes a lot of my career has been like, I know how to get shit done from a place of grind. And, but I think that my best work comes from when I operate from a place of joy. And so 2018 for me is figuring out the tools and the approaches and the mindsets I need to take to be designing from a place of joy rather than a place of grind and stress. Where do you see yourself in the next five years when you look, you know, kind of down the road? What do you want to be working on? What sort of things do you want to do? In the next five years, I want to be exploring these intersections of fields that have not traditionally been in designed, right? So like I mentioned one earlier, like the whole idea of like emotional intelligence or like the whole self-help industry. I think there's been a lot of like literature and theoretical frameworks and approaches given to emote how how we grow as emotional beings. But I think design does not enter that space very much. The whole also we were talking about earlier, like, like bias and addressing issues of bias. I think like that is we're just starting to see the tip of the iceberg of where design technology can show up to address bias and create a more equitable and inclusive world. And so I see myself and I think what the world, what, what these spaces need right now is in both of them, I'd say like we think about like academic communities have shown up and contributed a lot to those spaces and, and many like the activist communities have shown up and contributed a lot but design and technology has been relatively silent. And I think that what these spaces need, whether when it comes to healing or when it comes to creating inclusion and equity, I think what these spaces need is people putting work out into the world. And we need provocations and we need, we need people putting out prototypes that help us learn and build and evolve and iterate our ideas. And so what I see myself in the next five years, or I guess your question was in five years, I see myself as having put out a bunch, hundreds of little prototypes of that, that are addressing these issues of emotions and healing or of bias and identity and having learned from actual work and actual prototypes and, and products that have, that have been aimed at addressing these issues. Well, Raphael, just to kind of wrap up you know, our conversation here, where can our audience find you online? Where can they follow your work? I just got on Instagram and I'm going to start. My goal is <laughs> with this whole like exploration. My Instagram is Raphael.Sergio.Smith and or my Twitter is Raphael underscore Smith. Those are probably the two most accessible ways of, of following my design work. All right. Sounds good. Well, Raphael Smith, first, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show Secondly, I think, you know, a lot of the things that you describe, you know, we're we're releasing this episode here right at the, you know, right near the beginning of the year. I think these are things that designers in general need to think about. A lot of what, you know, we spoke about with kind of design futures, designing from a place of joy. Like there's so many little profound things that you said <laughs> that I hope that people when mm. they're listening, they go back yeah. and like and like take notes. There's a lot of really, really profound things you said. I think what I took away from the most was designing from a place of joy. So much of what we do with design kind of tends to come and be seen as task-based. And what can Mm. end up happening is if we see it as task-based, we sort of have a problem when other people see it that way too. And so maybe if Mm -hmm. we're now designing from a different place, maybe that means other people will see design coming from a different place. And I think that a lot of the work that you're doing is really important. Keep putting these perspectives out there. I think more people definitely need to hear them. And uh, again, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Maurice. I really appreciate it. Thoughts of love are in your mind. And that's it for this week. Big thanks to Raphael Smith and thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Raphael and his work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. Also, thanks as always to our sponsors, Facebook Design, Glitch, Google Design, MailChimp, and SiteGround. Facebook designers work on creative products that are used by over 2 billion people. Facebook isn't just one product or one type of design problem, though. Their work transforms a number of industries from advertising, news, media, local business, video, and messaging. No other company designs at a massive scale like they do. Learn more about Facebook design at facebook.com forward slash design. Glitch is the friendly community where you'll build the web app of your dreams. 
Now, you might be thinking web app and thinking that's more for developers, but not for designers. And I'm here to tell you, get that notion out of your head, trust me. I mean, Glitch is really the kind of tool where you can really create whatever it is that you want, whether it's a website, a Slack bot, etc. You know, too many coding tools put up barriers to creativity with a lot of complicated setup and features. And Glitch really just lets you get started with no hassle at all. If you see a project that you like, you can remix that and make it your own. You can start from scratch. It's really super, super simple. I love playing around with Glitch. So what will you create today? Get started at glitch.com. Whether it's defining a branding style in VR or creating a voice user interface that actually feels human, Google Design is committed to sharing the best design thinking from Google and beyond. Sign up for great stories, events, and the latest updates on material design at design.google forward slash newsletter. You can also follow Google Design on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. MailChimp is the world's largest marketing automation platform. They support millions of customers from small e-commerce shops to big online retailers to podcasts like Revision Bath, and they support the creative community as well. MailChimp gives you the marketing tools to be yourself on a bigger stage. Visit MailChimp.com and sign up for a free account today. MailChimp. Send better email. Since 2004, SiteGround has been empowering web professionals and beginners alike to build better, faster, safer websites easily without having to worry about hosting. With different hosting platforms to suit every need, including managed WordPress hosting on all plans, SiteGround will not let you down. Visit SiteGround.com forward slash revision path to get 60% off on all hosting plans. SiteGround, web hosting crafted with care. This episode was edited by RJ Basilio and produced by me, Maurice Cherry. Our intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. If you like this episode, then please leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. It only takes a minute or two. It really, really, really helps the show out by bumping us up in the rankings there for Design Podcasts, not just here in the U.S., but around the world. And I'll even read your review right here on the show. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, if you're listening to this podcast, if you like this episode with Raphael and you want to hear next week's episode early, then you should become our patron over at Patreon. Now more than ever, Revision Path needs your support to make sure that stories about black designers and creatives in our field are being told in their own words. So if you support us, if you support our mission, just go to patreon.com forward slash revision path and pledge today. For just $5 a month, you can get access to behind-the-scenes information about the show, upcoming interviews, and so much more. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.